Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reese Cosgrove, and I'm a, a neurosurgeon with a history of fairly long personal history of performing surgery for intractable psychiatric illness. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this question and answer session. We've had three really um, novel presentations, which uh, I hope you've all listened to in advance of this. And um, uh, I will begin uh, uh, first with a comment to Dr. Davidson, uh, who spoke about uh, uh, focused ultrasound and capsulotomy. This comment is really that one of the most impressive things about your results, even though it's in a small number, was that um, your you really showed no significant cognitive changes. So one of the big criticisms about anterior capsulotomy in the past, the way it was done in years past, either with radiofrequency, um, less so with gamma knife, so another non-invasive technique of lesioning the anterior capsule fibers. Uh, do you have any insight onto um, how, why that might be? Thanks for the question, Dr. Cosgrove. Uh, yeah, we've actually been looking at that quite a lot more because as you say, that is uh, probably one of the most significant findings that, that, that we, we have really. Uh, we think it, it all has to do with lesion volume, uh, we suspect, and the placement of the lesion. So um, with focused ultrasound, we're making fairly small lesions in the most ventral aspect of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And we suspect that if our lesions stretched dorsally a little bit more, if they were enlarged dorsally, we would be disconnecting more of the fibers that uh, travel to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and are involved in more sort of executive function uh, circuitry. We might see a little bit more of these um, uh, cognitive or neuropsychological changes. Uh, so we suspect it, it mostly has to do with lesion volume. Um, you know, and we're also not passing through any fibers, you know, getting there with, with, with open surgery, I guess. Uh, but uh, Certainly the original lesions done with radiofrequency, uh, older yeah. ones in the older literature were, were much bigger and uh, more, sure. more highly disconnecting of frontal, bilateral frontal cortex. Yeah. Um, why do you think there was a, di now you have very num small numbers, so it's, it's hard to say anything about these, but, uh, and clearly, anterior capsule was primarily done for OCD, not so much for depression. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you explain the subtle difference between the two groups that you, you had almost what we'd expect to see in the OCD group and less than what we'd expect to see in a depression group? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, um, as you say, the, uh, the sort of the neurocircuitry based rationale for doing surgery in OCD uh, especially with this target, is stronger. I think there, there is more evidence to support that uh, disconnecting the sort of limbic cortical striatal circuit should help OCD. Um, and the evidence for it helping uh, depression it, it is not as strong, which in theory was reflected in our, you know, two out of six depression patients versus four out of six OCD patients. Uh, you know, there are a couple of uh, uh, series in the last, you know, five to 10 years, particularly out of the UK that, that, that you know, were published uh, suggesting maybe about a sort of 30 to 50% response rate uh, in depression patients, but it, it doesn't seem to be as quite as robust. Um, and it's, it, it probably has to do with the neurocircuitry being different and also depression itself being so heterogeneous um, by comparison. So, you know, although we sort of, we have sort of a, a phenotype in mind that, that we're sort of picturing when we enroll patients, there's still, you know, many subtypes of depression that are getting lumped in together. So I think it's probably those two factors. Uh, a question from the chat uh, is, uh, if can you comment on what you think the mechanism was for those who had improved cognition? So it's one thing to show that you have not demonstrated a deterioration in cognition. Can you can you comment on what you think the mechanism might be of improved cognition? 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Um, we actually, and we actually have a, a paper in press right now where we have specifically looked at the cognitive changes at an individual uh, level. So that's coming out in a month or two in translational psychiatry. Um, but uh, to sum it up, we were quite careful to avoid something called practice effects, where where subjects are improving simply because they're doing the same test twice. So we used alternate versions of the tests and they were, you know, they were spaced out by uh, essentially seven months or so because the subject did it before and then seven months after. So we don't think it was practice effects where we did see improvement. We think it is real. Um, there was some correlation between um, improvement on uh, cognitive tests and improvement in, in mood symptoms. Um, but but in general, it seems like it's independent. Um, so my guess is it just has to do with uh, the simple fact that if someone improves in their depression or their OCD, even from medications or cognitive therapy, they, their cognitive scores tend to improve. Um, and I think it's it's two separate effects. If you're feeling better, you're able to devote more mental uh, resources to, to, to those cognitive tests. But uh, as you point out, our numbers are small, so so we're not able to to clearly distinguish um, if we're directly affecting circuits, uh, 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 you know, involving these cognitive processes or not. So next, I'll direct a question to Dr. Suk from uh, Yonsei University in Korea. It's one of the questions I had uh, as well, but this also comes from the chat. Dr. Suk, what was your methodology for targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? And then a, a follow-on question was, what do you think uh, estimate the dimensions of the volume of that target was being stimulated? Yeah, um, I, we are using the MNI coordinates to, to targeting dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we are stimulating target thing the um, target with uh, matrep. So we com converted to the individual MRI to the uh, normalized the uh, uh, template MNI template, and we target the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, MNI coordinate is, sorry. Mm, the no, target, that, that, yeah. that's, that's okay, but but then, and then it was just a small portion. It looked like on your, it would be a, 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 a more, the a more anterior portion of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, at least on, and it would be a small portion, but with a, with a deeper stimulation into maybe white matter tracts as well. Yeah. Um, it is referenced from other um, TMS research, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex MNI coordinate uh, for the um, negative 44, 40, and 229. So um, we um, stimulate that target with the uh, within five millimeter diameter. Five millimeter diameter from that target. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay. And uh, one other question that came from the chat room was, did patients have any somatic sensations associated with the active low intensity focused ultrasound versus the sham? Did yeah. any Did any patients know that they were could perceive that they were getting the active? Yeah, no, no patients or no participants uh, differentiated active or sham stimulation. And I also um, experienced uh, sample active stimulation with FUS, uh, but I didn't experience any um, real physical sensation about Sonication stimulation. Okay, that's interesting. So you did it to yourself. Sure, I have a, one session. <laughs> did you feel better? <laughs> or or either maybe. <laughs> oh, that's and great. Very safe. Yeah, and comfortable. Very good. Very good. Um, 
All right. Uh, let me see. Um, and I think in your paper, you did discuss the frequency that you used for your stimulation and it was 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I think, I think in, in, in your presentation, you put that in. So, uh, uh there was a question from the chat regarding and that. The frequency of the, um, stimulation sonication device is operating at 250 kilohertz frequency. Uh, for was used for the stimulation. So, Dr. Suk, you have uh, uh, do you have one of the questions that came was how do you think low and in, low intensity stimulation focused ultrasound compares with RTMS, you know, uh, TCDS, uh, uh, ECT tax therapy? How do you see it fitting in? I think I think my impression is TDCS is the weakest neuromodulation modulation technique among you who commented, but transcranial magnetic stimulation and uh, low intensity focused ultrasound stimulation is similar to the uh, on the treatment effect. And so uh, low intensity focused ultrasound stimulation is very promising technique for the neuromodulation activating or deactivating prefrontal cortex without any invasive or ablation technique. So I think the raw intensity uh, transcranial ultrasound stimulation is uh, another useful option for uh, with similar efficacy of the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, but another advantage is the of the trans TFOS stimulation is, is very comfortable. TMS is slightly uncomfortable. TMS make uh, headache or uh, mild headache or any other discomfort, but TFOS make any other um, discomfort. It is very uh, safe and comfortable. ECT, although ECT is more proper, but um, it is very invasive and uh, cognitive, it may induce cognitive sequelae. So I think TFOS is very safe and effective treatment option for neural modulation. Okay. I, I'm going to get a, a question directed to Norman. I can't, I'm just a simple neurosurgeon. I don't understand these complicated you know, nuanced neuropsychological tests that you do, but why did you choose those for testing your amygdala stimulation? Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so at UCLA, we're fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Michelle Krask on our faculty, and we asked for her help in picking tests that would allow us to detect changes in amygdala function, not only objectively, uh, but also subjectively through the uh, ratings given by the participants. And by objective, you meant some of the uh, trans, uh, the bio, the biomarkers. The uh, exactly. Okay. So I had a question though. Also, how did you? So the entorhinal cortex and the amygdala are actually basically contiguous. So they're they're right they're right beside each other and folded. So how did you how how did you were you able to target those two differentially? Given that you're you're holding a pretty big device. Sure. So. We actually uh, targeted the right amygdala and the left entorhinal cortex, so that helped us a little bit. Uh, but we uh, we actually targeted specifically within the entorhinal cortex the perforant path, uh, and we basically just adjusted the transducer and co and collected re repeated MRI focalizers until we were confident that we were aimed at the perforant path. So this you do this. In the MRI scanner, and how do you? Uh, what is the signal you get in the MRI scanner that tells you that? No. So we're not actually. We don't actually get a, a signal. What we're just doing is we're basically taking a line that's orthogonal to the surface of the transducer and tracing it down into the brain, and then we're measuring using a ruler the focal depth of the transducer. Oh, I see. So it's it, it's pretty geometric and uh, uh, alignment. Exactly. You're not looking for a signal change to define that you're on target. 
It's a mechanical, exactly. mechanical measurement. Okay. Yeah, we 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 do uh, arterial spin labeling as sort of a biomarker for change, but that's uh, that's our that's a different abstract at this conference and the uh, as a poster. Okay, I'm going to ask you a, a question: Is what do you think the mechanism of focused ultrasound stimulation is? And I'll ask Dr. Uh, Swek the same. And maybe Ben, I, I, I want to hear what some experts. What do they? What do you guys think is the mechanism of of low intensity focused ultrasound? You get to go first, Norman. Sure, I think it's primarily um, mechanical in nature. I don't think there's much of a thermal effect, especially at the uh, the types of low intensities that we're doing uh, with low intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, I think there's probably some sort of a, a, a cavitation-like effect um, leading to stretching of the, it's unclear to me at this time whether it's, you know, stretching of the membrane, stretching of ion channels, but I think it's more of a mechanical than a thermal effect. Dr. Suek, do you have any, can you go any deeper? No, I have another idea. I agree with Norman's opinion. It's the mechanical effect of uh, uh, for the neuron, maybe uh, induce may induce change in the neuron in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, but uh, we are also noticed the uh, mechanical energy also induce the change on the nerves electrical potential. So I think I agree with the Norman's opinion. Ben, you're going to be doing a PhD in this. No, <laughs> I'm just uh, no. I, I, I'm neuro imaging psychiatry. And yeah, no, but Ben Davidson's going to be doing his PhD in this, so this may be a question that you may take to your grave. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, to be honest, Dr. Cosgrove, I, I'm primarily using focused ultrasound for its lesional uh, lesional effects, so I I don't actually have much to add on this on this topic. I. Uh, intuitively, I, I agree. It's probably some kind of mechanical effect. I, I, I think it'd be hard to conceive uh, how else it, it would be uh, modulating uh, the brain, but there's certainly, you know, I suppose other possibilities. But I, I don't have much to add on that. So, so from the, the three of you, then, what do you think would be the best way to investigate this question, because nobody understands this. We think of it some sort of mechanical perturbation, but that's sort of an easy answer. Um, what would be, if I gave you all, you know, a million dollars, how would you think you would study this question? Of how does focused ultrasound modulate the brain when used at low, low intensity? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I mean, I'd, I, I think you'd want to you'd want to start with an animal model and then work your way up. Um, but in an animal model, you could do you know you could you could perform a series of low intensity um, focused ultrasounds and sacrifice the animal. Um, you know, uh, yeah. any neurochemical change. Yeah, and, uh, and you could just go from there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that the way I think you have to investigate it in a dish, yeah. you know, somehow or or in a model that you can slice or something. But yeah, this is a really an un, an unanswered question. Uh, that uh, uh, I mean, we we're describing effects, and, yeah. and I think they're real, but it certainly is an unanswered question. So let me thank you for your talks; they were fantastic. Uh, thank you for. Um, uh, uh, thank you for everybody for joining us, uh, and thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much for thank having you. us.